Oh, not very long. My fire signal. Uh, but can you guys hear me? Can you see my? Ah, yeah. I think you can see my screen now. Anyway, good morning, everybody, and welcome to week three of uh, math um, 191 special topic computational inverse problems. So, what have we done in the past uh, two weeks of classes? Number one, we look at the, the very niche inverse problems. And what are the inverse problems? How it differ from um, how it differ from forward problems? And I guess uh, I hope you now appreciate this is somewhat of the problems, right? So we have a phenomenon, we have a process, we want to control it in a sense that we want to get the desired output. So it's different from a forward problem because ito hinahinap natin what is the cause of a desired effect? What are the inputs necessary to get a desired output? And what we learned from last week, I para ma magkaroon ng isang meaningful discussion or meaningful solution about an inverse problem, we need to know or understand thoroughly kung paano nag-work yung process. So we always begin the analysis of an inverse problem by having an, a good idea or a good understanding of the underlying governing principle, which we try to write into an equation or a relation, which we will then define to be the forward operator, right? So meron tayong operator and basically we said that any operator say curly m is simply a function uh, simply a function that takes the input space into the output space right so you have a set of inputs and then for each of uh, these sets or uh, this tuple of inputs may makukuha tayong unique output so basically ang um, operator m natin ay isa lang talagang function pero tinatawag ko siyang operator just to signify that it is not just, say, a set of real numbers being mapped to another set of real numbers or an n-tuple of real numbers mapped to an m-tuple of real numbers. So, possibling um, mas generic yung input space at saka yung output space. For instance, uh, the input space could be the set of all um, continuous functions on the closed interval A, B, right? Tapos, imamap ko siya sa set of real numbers. So, basically, it's still a function. Bibigyan kita ng isang function. Tapos, hahayaan ko yung curly M mag-act doon sa isang continuous function, say, F. Yung makukuha kong MF ay isang real number. So, basically, it's still a function, pero ang domain niya ay set of functions. So, for instance, the integral operator, the definite integral operator. So, for instance, I have a function F. Pwede ko siyang imap say isang real number which is defined to be the definite integral of f of x dx over the interval a b all right so that means the image of f under curly m is simply a real number equal to the definite integral of f over the interval a b provided that f is continuous para maging well defined yung um, yung definite integral all right and this is what is nice about uh, operators because these are uh, functions that maps um, even an infinite dimensional space onto a um, or into or onto a, a, a finite dimensional space. So ito ay infinite dimensions, ito ay one dimensional, okay pa rin. Pero we don't expect this to be a surjective map. Uh, dun sa example natin last time, uh, we said the, the, the oops, Pwede namang CM ay operator from, say, um, the set of um, n by 1 vectors. Tapos, imamap natin sila sa n by 1 vectors in such a way that uh, this is via matrix multiplication. I think this is where we stopped last time. Diniscuss natin yung example ng, uh, let me double check. Yeah, we discussed the example of a well-posed problem na nagbibigay ng isang ill-posed inverse problem. So can anybody remind me what are the three desirable properties of a problem which Hadamard referred to as being well-posed? So sabi ni Hadamard, may tatlong properties tayo minahanap para sa isang problem para masabi na siya ay well-posed. Or you can reduce it to even two. So can anyone remind me? O oh, kahit isa. 
para tatlo ka agad yung mga pag-recite. Kailan? Nagiging well-posed ang isang problem. Ano yung tatlo or dalawang properties that can give us well-posedness? Ah, yes, Prince. You can say all, you can yes. say one. That's up to you. May at least one. One solution. Right, great. So, dapat merong at least isang solution. That's H1, right? That's condition H1. Dapat yung problem meron muna at least isang solution. Uh, next, I see lots of people raising hands. Uh, yes, Trisha. Uh, can you give me one? Okay, that's H2. Sabi ni Trisha, dapat yung problem merong at most one solution. So, what Prince and Trisha alluded to can be further uh, reduced into a single condition. Condition na dapat exactong isa yung solution. And the third one, uh, Lian? The solution depends continuously on given data. All right. And I think this is uh, one important. Ito yung medyo mahirap yung sa tatlong conditions. Dapat daw yung solution ay nagdidepende continuously on the data. Or in a nutshell, pag merong nabago ng konti dun sa data, dapat konti lang din yung magiging pagbabago dun sa solution. All right? Thank you, uh, Prince, Trisha, and Lian. So, and that's what we illustrated in terms of, say, the, the operator curly M defined by matrix multiplication. So, din define natin last time. Oh, ito yung uh, operator curly M, which is a map that takes the two-dimensional vector space R2 onto the set of two dimensional uh, uh, two dimensional uh, vector space of real numbers so r2 to r2 such that the image of a two vector under the the operator curly m is the matrix m defined by this two by two guy over here times the given input vector x sinabi na natin oh matrix multiplication lang yan kung so kung meron akong two by one vector Min multiply ko siya sa or pin rem multiply ko siya by a 2 by 2 matrix magkakaroon ako ng isang unique na 2 by 1 vector as my output so you are given uh, uh, any data uh, any 2 by 1 vector as your data in the forward problem you multiply it by the matrix m you get the image of that uh, given vector x under curly m and that will be unique kasi nga well defined yung matrix multiplication for any 2 by 1 vector so ibig sabihin na satisfy ng matrix multiplication of forward problem si H1 at saka si H2 and then we are uh, we will be testing H3 yung yung uh, solution ba nakadepende continuously dun sa data baguhin natin ng konti yung data malaki ba yung magiging pagbabago dun sa solution so I did sort of an experimentation here, and what I did is, uh, uh, what I want to do is to show that for any perturbation or any little change, if I impose a little change, we call perturbation, to the data, ano yung mangyayari dun sa solution? And that's what I did. I considered, say, a noise vector or a measurement noise or measurement error vector E, which is, which is of small relatively small um, magnitude compared to the input. So, sinabi ko lang, ah, okay, kunwari meron kang error, babaguhin ko ng konti yung input vector x. So, ito, itong vector e na to, 2 by 1, siya ay ia-add ko doon sa data, doon sa problem. So, I'll have a vec an input vector x, dadagdagan ko siya ng konting perturbation o konting noise. So, sa data modeling, and tawag dito sa perturbation na to ay noise. And we will see noise uh, later and how it affects the entire inverse problem. But for now, yeah, uh, dadagdagan ko ng noise yung input. So, imbes na i-input uh, ko dun sa operator M, curly M, si X, ang i-input ko ay si X plus E. And I will, I want to know what's the effect of that additional noise to the solution, all right? And I'll do relative errors to do the comparison. So, kunwari, yung noise na dadagdag ko ang kanyang relative magnitude ay epsilon, right? You always measure in relative terms because hindi natin alam ano yung nature nung, uh, nung input vector x. So, when measuring things relative to other things, para masabi na siya ay maliit o malaki with respect to another reference, lagi natin gagamitin yung relative error. 
para makuha natin ilang percent yung noise na dinagdag ko. So you take the size of your vector E, uh, which we arbitrarily chose to be the L2 norm. It could be the L1 norm. It could be uh, L infinity norm. Maybe we can talk about um, norms later, but I hope last time, I think I did define what the L2 norm of a vector is. This is just the square root of the sum of the squares of the entries of the vector. So that means this is the square root of E1 squared plus E2 squared. All right. Para mal, uh, then I compute this para malamang ko kung ilang percent noong input vector yung size noong, uh, noong perturbation. All right. Then I'll just assume that this is small. Okay. Uh, how small? It's usually relative to the given problem. So usually 1% noise is good. Uh, minsan meron tayong mas malaking liberty na ah, kung, kung hindi maganda yung measurement device nyo, siguro yung noise na kailangan yung i it consider could be 5%, and then you want correspondingly small change in the output. But nevertheless, assume epsilon is of the right size, then we test. Gano ka robust sa perturbation or, or sa noise dun sa data yung ating process? In this case, the forward problem, the forward operator curly M. So I'll input to uh, curly M the noisy data X plus epsilon. Tawagin ko siyang noisy data. Pag sabi ko noisy, Ibig sabihin, may kasamang noise, yung data. So the noisy data, x plus epsilon, I'll apply uh, the curl, the operator curly M to it, we'll get mx plus me, right? Or matrix mx plus matrix me via the distributive property of matrix multiplication. And then titignan ko ngayon, gano kalaki yung pagbabago mula dun sa output, which is supposedly just mx, all right? Dun sa walang noise na data, compared to the output mula dun sa noisy data. So what I'll do is I'll take the absolute difference between the uh, the solution from the noisy data minus the solution from the noise-free data. All right, so yun yung gagawin ko numerator. We call this the residual or the absolute difference between the two solutions, right? So ito yung noisy solution, ito yung noise-free solution. Titingnan ko gaano kalaki yung pagbabago sa kanila. Well, again, it doesn't make sense. Hindi, na, hindi tayo magkakaroon ng idea kung malaki ba yung change or hindi kapag katiningan lang natin yung absolute difference. Okay? Because this difference could be a vector consisting of entries na ang order niya ay puro hundreds. Uh, uh, and then that could be small or large depending on what was the number we are comparing it to. All right? Pwede siyang 0.001 sa 0.005 but that could be big if the entries of the of the vector that we are comparing it to are very very small so kaya laging relative yung kinukuha nating measurements kasi nga para makita natin ilang percent or relative to what we are dun sa ating reference yung pagbabago right so kaya siguro uh, siguro matrain na kayo ngayon na laging yung pagmeasure ay in terms of preference or relative change or relative difference okay Ganun din sa 1740 ba? Dun sa exercise nyo kahapon, uh, laging percent yung gusto kong description ng accuracy. Right? Okay. And then if you do that, actually dito kaya natin gawin siya analytically. Uh, but in, some, uh, in most problems, hindi natin to kaya. So, kukunin ko to. Ah, so, ang mx plus e, yung solution from the noisy data, ay mx plus me. Solution from the noise-free data ay mx. So mx plus uh, mx plus me minus mx will just give us me, and then kukunin natin yung change. Uh, mina measure natin yung change with respect to the uh, the noise-free solution. So meron kang mx sa denominator, property of norms. Pero mo siya paghiwalayan. Okay, pag pinaghiwalay mo siya, magkansal yung norm ng m, matitira eto size ng e over size ng input which is basically our epsilon. So that means in this uh, in this uh, process, yung epsilon uh, relative size ng noise caused an epsilon relative size change the sa ating output, right? So epsilon a change sa uh, epsilon a change sa uh, input nagbigay sa atin ng epsilon na change sa output. And you can say, oh, that's a good compromise. 
Kasi magkasa, magkaparehas lang ng level. So if epsilon say is 1%, ibig sabihin pagka meron kang noise na 1% dun sa data, magkakaroon ka lang din ng around 1% na noise doon sa solution. So we can say that this is a fair game. Na, okay, mukhang nagde-depend continuously yung ating solution dun sa data because the small change in the data brought about a small change also in the solution. But you can say, sir, how close is close or gano kaliit dapat yung change doon sa solution with respect to the change of, uh, in the data. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule. Ano? So it could depend from application to application. Sometimes uh, kapag ka 1% yung error sa, sa data or yung noise, siguro pwedeng umabot ng 5 to 10% yung change in the solution and still we can consider it to be uh, a well-posed problem. Uh, minsan, hindi. Yung 1% solution, dapat mag, uh, 1% noise, mag-cost lamang ng around 1% um, change in the uh, change in the uh, solution. So, uh, yun. Nagdidepende siya from problem to problem. Pero siguro, as a general uh, convention na lang sa klase, siguro, hanggang mga 5 or 10 times. Sige, papayagan natin. 5 to 10 times the noise you change in the solution. That's fine for us. But anything beyond that, by default, unless I tell you otherwise, I sasabihin natin, well, uh, ill post na siya. Or hindi nag-depend continuously sa data yung solution. Alright? So in summary, napakita natin to last time, na medyo inulit ko ulit. Sorry for mumbling, pero I, I think sometimes repetition is good for new topics, ano? especially dun sa mga hindi pa naka-encounter nito before. So, yun. Um, napakita natin na matrix multiplication or this forward problem is basically well posed. Now, we look for the inverse problem and we have seen that the inverse problem is a, is a different story. So, the inverse problem, for instance, is ganto naman. I want to find the input vector x that will give me the output vector 2, 2. So, inverse problem siya kasi alam mo yung output Inahanap natin yung input. Tapos sa inverse problems, ang data ay laging yung desired output. Because this is what we have. Given sa atin to, dun sa inverse problems, so ito yung i-consider natin to be the data dun sa inverse problem. And to check H3, we want to perturb the data. So babaguhin ko to ng counting kaunti, say 1%, and then I want to know what's the effect of that change to the obtained solution. Okay. But of course, before we go to H3, check muna natin yung H1 and H2. But uh, last time, I think we discussed that this matrix M, yung binigay natin kanina sa forward problem, yung forward, uh, yung, yung matrix uh, modeling the forward operator is actually um, invertible because it has a non-zero determinant. And so for any vector X, lagi tayong may mahanap na solution dun sa inverse problem. And that solution X star is basically the inverse of M times the data. All right? So, yeah, parang inverse process lang talaga. So, kung ito yung gusto mong output, yung input na kailangan mo para makuha yan is just M inverse times 2, 2. And we will get 2, 0. All right? So, meron siyang solution. Meron unique solution. Actually, this could be generalized. Kahit ano pa yung data, lagi kang merong makukuhang unique solution because basically, Para lang makuha yung solution sa inverse problem, you're multiplying by the matrix M inverse. Okay? So H1, H2 are good, but it will fail H3. Kasi nakita natin, pag binago ko ng kaunti, say, eto, nag-introduce ako ng epsilon, ah, sorry, ng noise, ng noise vector E doon sa aking data. So in best na MX equals 2, 2, yung isosolve ko, ang isosolve ko MX equals data plus the noise say 2 and 2.001 how big is the perturbation that we uh, that we uh, introduced we introduce a perturbation of around 0.35% lamang or the relative uh, size is 3.54 times 10 to the minus 4 so that's very small right so if h3 is satisfied i am expecting that the solution that i'll get will not differ so much on a relative sense Doon sa nakuha nating solution, which is 2, 0. 2, 0 nga ba? Yes. Doon sa unperturbed o doon sa noise-free data. Alright? Kasi ang liit ng noise na in-introduce in ko. Ito lang yung noise na in-introduce ko. 
ang size niya ay 0.35% of the input vector. Pero pag kinumpute ko yung solution, remember the, the solution to the inverse problem is simply m inverse times whatever your data is. In this case, our data is noisy. Ang nakuha kong solution ay 1, 1. Pero dun sa original problem, ang nakuha nating solution sa inverse problem ay 2, 0. And at least visually, comparing these two solutions, 1, 1 and 2, 0, parang ang laki ng change. What I was expecting is, nagbago lang by some decimal digits, right? Yung, yung data, dapat siguro naging, nakuha ko lang solution ay 2.002, comma zero so something very similar to this but no i got a very different solution one one so at yung parang visual o parang gut feel na description doon sa doon sa relative change doon sa output sometimes i'll ask you for just that pero if i ask you to back it up with some analytic arguments you can say all right para masabi ko makumbinsi kita sir na laki ng pagbabago doon sa input kung hindi ka pa naniniwala Na yung 1, 1, sobrang layo sa 2, 0. Ganito yung gagawin ko. Again, I'll get the relative change in the solution. So I'll compute what is the size of the change in the solution. So x star is the solution from the noise-free data. x prime is the solution from the noisy data. I'll get their difference. The difference is 1, comma, negative 1. But I don't know. Is 1, comma, negative 1? Uh, huge compared to uh, compared to the relative uh, compared to the noise free solution. So para malaman ko, malaki ba na yung vector na one negative one na yan with respect to the benchmark um, vector kung saan ko siya dapat i-compare relative error ang kukunin ko. So the absolute difference or the size of the absolute difference or what we call the residual, i-divide ko siya by the, the size kung ano man yung gusto kong solution. Right? So I'll divide these two guys. I'll get square root of 2 over 2. The answer is 0 0.7071, right? So it means then, yung 0.35% na change doon sa ating uh, na noise, all right? 0.35% na change doon sa data, nag na 70% change doon sa solution obtained. So 0.35 ang ating rule of thumb, at most uh, 10 times of that. So 0.35% times 10, that's 3.5%. This is even around 20 times that. Tama ba 20 times? Para mali yung sinabi ko last time. 200 times about 20 times. It's a 200 times. So yung, yung, point 30, yung point 0.7 ay about 200 times. Tama ba? Nang 0.35. So ibig sabihin, ang laki. So sobra-sobra siya dun sa threshold natin. Around times 10 lamang yung ating i-consider na roughly um, um acceptable change dun sa solution, all right? So 0.35% change in the uh, in the data plus 70% change in the solution, hindi ito well false because H3 is not satisfied, okay? Now, ito yung hindi natin nagawa last time. Sorry, napahaba yung, yung review, pero hopefully you didn't get bored uh, with that. <laughs> so 25 minutes sa kagad, yun nakalip, nakalipas mula dun sa klase. Siguro next time, ikliang ko na yung review, ano? But if you if you want this kind of thorough review, I can do that because now I will supplement what what, uh, what was discussed earlier. Because this is the difference. There is a well posed problem, ill uh, posed problem, ill posed, well posed forward problem, ill posed yung uh, yung inverse problem, and the ill posedness of that problem was caused about by the non satisfaction of H three. Okay, yung H one and sa yung H two dun sa inverse problem sa H three siya pumalya. Pero may mas grabe pa mga inverse problem dyan. So, for instance, or bef uh, siguro before I go there, okay, bakit importante yung pagkoconsider ng noise? Actually, makikita uli natin yan sa module number 3. Pero kasi sa totoong buhay, yung mga inverse problems, nakukuha natin yan or na, 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 na perform natin sila by doing some measurements. Meron kang isang physical phenomenon. And then you want to know what's the effect of that physical phenomenon. Um, alimbawa, isang magandang inverse problem. Ito yung usual inverse problem sa, sa Texas. Kasi yung uh, almost lahat sa, sa electrical engineering department in line, even from the math department, are into oil imaging. So, paano siya nangyayari? Um, diba, so, 
syempre naghahanap ka ng oil. Oil is a very uh, important resource. Ano? Um, so, diba, meron kang oil deposit dyan. Tapos, ito yung uh, surface ng earth. Basta, ito yung surface ng earth. And then, what oil companies will do, they will drill for oil, right? And uh, how do we know that there's oil in a certain, uh, in a certain area? Uh, the primitive way of doing so is mag-drill ka lang na mag-drill. Hopefully, you hit uh, an oil mine, right? Or an oil deposit. Or pwede ka rin na mag-miss. Uh, mag so, it's a hit or miss process. So, medyo mahal na mag-drill without the certainty of getting oil, all right? So, ganyan yung ginagawa. So, that's why people are developing or uh, electrical engineers and mathematicians are developing ways para magkaroon ng uh, mas efficient na ways and accurate ways to do oil imaging. So, ang ginagawa nila, for instance, if you're working with acoustics, ang ginagawa nila, meron ka dito oops, sorry. Meron ka dito parang speaker or sound source. Uh, tawagin natin itong transmitter. Transmitter. Dito sa surface ng earth. Tapos, uh, sige, lagyan natin dito ng rocks. Uh, ito ay mga sediments. Ano? So, ang gagawin ng transmitter, magbubuga siya ng acoustic signals doon sa subsurface of the earth. So, magbubuga siya dyan ng signal, magbubuga siya ng signal, ultra up. Okay. Tapos, uh, yung, yung sound ito na ibubuga niya will, will, uh, will cause some echoes na babalik doon sa subsurface. Right? Depende dun sa material composition nung tinamaan niya. Kasi nag, uh, yung echo na nabubuhay nakadepende dun sa material na nag ng echo. So, alimbawa, yung sound na nanggaling dun sa transmitter, tumama dun sa rocks, it will create, say, a certain kind of echo. Right? Tapos, ganun din yung mangyayari kung tumama siya sa sediments, magproproduce siya ng echo but a different kind na babalik dun sa surface. And then yung oil... Pag tinamaan siya ng, uh, ng sound, may, may ibabalik din niya na echo papunta doon sa papunta doon sa surface. So what uh, what engineers or this pet, yeah, petroleum engineers or kung sino man yung naka-assign sa imaging, ano, what they do is to take measurements of these echoes. So ang ginagawa, meron dito mga geophones or receivers that will try to uh, collect yung echo mula doon sa sub uh, mula doon sa subsurface and then they will analyze ito yung nakuha kong echo so mula doon ire-reconstruct ko ano yung naging cause nung echo na yon ibig sabihin i will reconstruct or i'll create an image or a map of the subsurface but of course they don't get exact data from these readings kasi any physical measurement device will have an associated error to it Kahit nga yung tipong ruler natin, pag sinabi niyang one inch yung measurement, hindi siya exactong one inch. Kasi meron sigurado doong measurement ever. Alright? So, ganun yung nangyayari. Yung mga data nilang nakukuha dito, na i-feed nila dun sa kanilang inverse problem solver para makuha yung mapa ng subsurface, ay hindi exacto. It could be tainted by measurement noise. It can be tainted by sort of just an equipment failure and, or the uh, otherwise inadequacies of the, the system. Or meron dito mga, mga mas maliliit na sediments that can affect yung echo na makukuha which cannot be taken into account into the model. Right? That's ang models, approximation lang naman ng totoong mundo. So makukuha mo talagang equation ay hindi yung exacto. So instead of, Ang gusto mo mag-solve ng inverse problem ng itsura ay mf equals g. You want to you want to get what is the, the 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 cost of an output g. So you solve mo tong inverse problem na ito. Or ito yung ideally gusto mong isolve. Pero if g was obtained from measurements, hindi talaga g yung nakukuha mong fini-feed mo dun sa inverse problem solver mo. Instead of add of uh, having data equal to g noisy yung data na makukuha mo or tainted ng measurement yung data na gagamitin mo dun sa inverse problem. So what you end up solving is not MF equals G. Ang sinosolve mo talaga ay MF equals G plus epsilon. 
So, and then if you do this, ibig sabihin, may makukuha ko, dun, makukuha ka dito ng solution, tawagin natin F prime yung nakuha mong solution, kapag ka yung data ay hindi nagde-depend continuously, oh sorry, pag yung solution ay hindi nagde-depend continuously dun sa data, alright, etong F prime na nakuha mong solution mula dun sa noisy data might be very different from the actual solution or the actual cost F star you are uh, looking for. So, and then yung, yung effect nito, uh, so it is then you don't have or you don't get a good reconstruction of the input. Kasi nga, yung, yung posibleng etong noise na to, o yung measurement error na yan, caused a very huge change in the solution. Kaya medyo delikado yung mga ill post problems and basically um, lahat ng inverse problems na nanggagaling sa physical measurements sa ill post. So, yun yung idea. Kaya dun sa modeling, ng, ng, or pagsasolve ng inverse problems, lagi dapat nakasama yung pagchecheck ng robustness against noise. Right? I hope I'm, uh, I'm making sense here because I want you to understand yung, yung underlying mga principles muna bago we go to the actual computations. Okay. With this, with this in mind, let's take a look at another class of inverse problems na mas grabe yung ill-posedness. Mas grabe, quote, and, and um, end quote, kesa dun sa ill-posedness na nakita natin kanina dun sa square matrix. So, there are some inverse problems na medyo mas malaki yung problema natin. Halimbawa, this is our inverse problem. I want to look for a vector x such that its product with the matrix M is equal to, say, 1, 0, 0. All right? So, ito yung inverse problem ko. My data is 1, 0, 0, the desired output after the matrix multiplication. Kaya lang, ang siste dito, ang aking matrix M ay rectangular. I mean, hindi siya square. And it is a 3 by 2. So M is a 3 by 2 matrix. 3 by 2 matrix consisting of real entries. So by the way, this will be my notation for set of matrices. Ano? So the subscripts of curly M will tell us an in dimension of matrix. So three rows, two columns, tapos yung set na nandito, dun ng gagaling yung elements ng matrix ko. So our matrix M here is three by two, right? Tapos ang desired output natin ay anong size nito? Ito ay nasa R3, or it's um, three by one. So para meron akong three by two, para magkaroon ng product na three by one, this guy should be 2 by 1. Right? So, naghahanap ako ng 2 by 1 matrix na pag pinost multiply ko kay matrix M, ang makukuha ko ay si 1, 0, 0. Kaya lang dito, hindi nagagana yung ginawa nating solution doon sa previous problem kasi nga, kasi nga singular si M. Ibig sabihin, walang inverse si uh, matrix M. Kasi ang inverses ay defined lamang para sa square matrices. May problema pa nga doon. Hindi lahat ng square matrices ay may inverses or may inverse. Right? So, but right here and now, pwede na natin masabi na singular talaga to kasi 3 by 2 siya, hindi siya square. So, that means automatically, posibleng hindi nasasatisfy si H1 at saka si H2. Actually, I forgot to check it. Mm. Yeah, I think wala itong solution. May mga rectangular system na merong unique solution. May mga rectangular systems na may infinitely many solutions. But this given, uh, this given rectangular system will not have a solution at all. That means you cannot find, however, whatever method you use, you cannot find a 2 by 1 vector that when post multiplied to M will give us 1, 0, 0. So, dun pa lamang, bagsak na itong inverse problem natin sa H1 at saka sa H2. So, meaning there's no, chan there's no chance that this is well posed. So, may mga ganong inverse problem na nagsasoftware like, ng ill-posedness kasi hindi talaga nila nasasatisfy kahit si H1 or kahit si H2. Right? So, pero minsan mapili tayo. Alam niyo naman ng mga mathematicians, gusto nila laging masolve lahat ng bagay. Kahit na nga sinabing walang solution, pasaway tayo. Dapat magkaroon pa rin to ng some sort of us quote-unquote solution o magkaroon ng pseudo-solution. So, whenever you are 
pressed with an inverse problem like this, you can decide, ano yung tatawagin kong solution? Or I can rephrase the problem so that I can admit at least one, or actually I can admit a lot of solutions. All right? So kung meron kang mx equals b, tawagin ko na lang b at itong uh, data vector natin. So pag meron kang mx equals b, kahit wala siyang exact solution, sige, gagawin ko pa rin siya ng remedyo. Instead ng equality yung problem, gagawin ko na lang approximately equal. All right? So that means now I'm looking for an approximate solution. I want to find a, matri uh, a vector x that when post multiplied to matrix M will give me approximately the right hand side vector B. This should have been a bold uh, B. All right. So, ayun yung is ilan dun sa mga typos. Ano? So, ngayon, tayo magsasabi, ano yung meaning ng approximative equation na to? Or how good is the approximation, uh, what, how good the approximation should be para matawag natin na si vector X sa isang solution. Maybe for this particular illustration, I'll say na dapat ito ay totoo in the L2 sense. That means if I get the uh, magnitude of mx minus b relative to b, dapat ito ay maliit. Right? Pag nakakita kayo ng less than na magkapatong, right? ang tawag dyan ay para le uh, much, much less than, all right? much, much less than 1. So I want the relative uh, difference between mx minus b kasi nga walang chance na ito ay magsa-zero. Kasi walang vector x na exactong b yung sagot pag pinost multiply ko kay matrix m. So this guy will never be zero. Wala tayong exact solution, but we are allowing approximate solution. So the only condition that we will impose here is that this residual measured in the L2 sense divided by the L2 size of the right-hand side must be less uh, must be much, much less than the number one. Para medyo fraction na lang, maliit na percent lang yung relative error. Okay? Now, there are several ways. So, ngayon, approximative na to, so we can use different ways on how to solve this problem. Nasa atin na, tayo ngayon yung magde-decide. And sino-sino yung mga tatawagin kong solution. Okay? Now, one way to do this is to use what we call the moore penrose pseudo inverse. And this is what you're going to use in your... Uh, what you'll use in your uh, in homework number two, the Moore Penrose pseudo inverse. Yung mga nag 175 last semester, kilala nila yan, si Moore Penrose pseudo inverse. Uh, can anyone remind me? Paano nga nakuha si Moore Penrose pseudo inverse? So I want mx equals b. All right. Then muna tayo sa exact solution. Now, how do I get an approximate solution here? Paano, kong, paano, paano nga na derive yung Moore Penrose pseudo inverse? May nakakalala pa ba? Or sabis, uh, or nasa isip niyo, sir, why are you bringing up traumatic uh, memories, ano? the trauma of 175? Pero paano nga natin nakuha yung Bohr penrose pseudo inverse? Hindi niyo tanda. Okay. So, if you've already forgot, or dun sa mga hindi pa nakakalam, yung Bohr penrose pseudo inverse, Basically, for for nice vector uh, for nice matrices M, na kuha siya as the as the normal solution. Kukunin ko yung normal equation. So how do we form the normal equation? So I start with M x equals b, where M is uh, M by n. M is not necessarily equal to n. Uh, x is uh, n by one. So M by n times n by one equals M by one, which is basically ato yung itsura ng problem natin. Ngayon, it's a rectangular system. Now, what I'll do is to make use of the inversion process or the matrix inversion process, multiply ko ngayon or magmultiply ako both sides of the equation by the transpose of the matrix M. So, siguro, sulat ko rito, ito ay M by N, ito ay N by 1, ito ay M by 1, para well-defined. Now, do you guys remember what M transpose is? Um, meron pa bang hindi naglilinear algebra dito? Uh, can anyone na hindi pa naglilinear algebra use the raise hand button? Okay, good. Lahat kayo nakapag-linear algebra. Okay, so kukunin mo yung M transpose. Kung si M ay M by N, 
si uh, M transpose ay N by M, right? Kasi pinag-switch lang natin yung row at saka column number para dun sa transpose. So, I can indeed multiply. Ito kasi ay N by, uh, etong product na to ay M by 1. Tapos yung M transpose, ah, sorry, napalaki yung P. Yung M transpose ay N by M. And so it makes sense, right? N by M times M by 1, that's well defined. It's going to be an N by 1 matrix. Tapos dito ay magkakaroon ng M transpose B. This is N by M. This is M by 1. So the product is N by 1, the same as the right-hand side. So everything is good so far, right? Yun yun lang, be careful. Matrix multiplication is not commutative. So if you left multiplied M, M transpose on the left side, you should also left multiply it to the right side. Okay, dapat nagmamatch yung position. And then, I'm going to use the uh, associative property of matrix vector multiplication so that maggroup ko rito si M transpose at saka si M times X equals M transpose B. All right? And then, what is the size of M transpose M? Sige nga. Ano ang size ng product ni M transpose at saka ni M? Okay, si Jace hindi pa pala naglilinear algebra. So Jace, consider this to be your crash course in linear algebra. Right. Pero I hope you're familiar with at least matrix multiplication. Ano? Oh, ba't hindi kayo nagtaas ng kamay kanina? Pati daw si Mil. Or mabago lang yung internet ko, hindi ko nakita na nag-raise hand kayo. Ah, okay. So hindi pa kayo naglinear algebra. So sige, balikan ko yung M transpose. Ano? Okay. So, ano yung, uh, ano yung M transpose? Well, kapag ka meron akong matrix, oh, sige, yung example na lang natin, M. 3, 2, 1, 4, 0. 3, 2, 1, 4, 0, 1. 3, 1, 0. 2, 4, 1. Okay. So, kung ito si matrix M. Para makuha ko yung transpose ni M. So, si M to the T siya yung transpose ni M, pagbabalik ta rin ko lang yung address ng mga entries. I mean, this guy ay nasa first row, first column. Isa switch ko lang yung row at saka column number nila, I'll get its new address. Naninirahan siya ngayon sa 1, 1, first row, first column. Uh, Doon sa M transpose, maninirahan siya sa 1, 1 pa rin, right? Which is first row, first column pa rin. Ang, ang, uh, ito yung medyo may magbabago na. Yung, yung entry na 2. Si 2 ay nasa what? Anong address niya? 1 comma 2. Nasa first row, second column siya. Alright? Dun sa transpose, mapupunta siya dun sa flip address. So dun sa transpose, nandun na siya sa second row, first column. So si 2 mapupunta na dito. Sa 2, 1. Hindi na siya sa 1, 2 nakatira. Ito ay nasa 2, 1. Right? Second row, first column, maninirahan na siya sa 1, comma, 2. So, siya na yung nandito. Si 4, living in 2, 2, nasa 2, 2 pa rin siya dun sa transpose. Tapos ito, nasa 3, 1. So, mapupunta siya sa 1, 3. Nandito na siya. Tapos ito si 1, nasa third row, second column. So, ibig sabihin, titira na siya ngayon sa 2, 3. Second row, third column. So, ito na siya. So, ito yung itsura no M transpose. Oops. So it's not hard to, to imagine na kung meron pang M by N. All right? Siya ay mag, ang transpose niya ay magiging N by M. Kasi nga nangyayari, yung mga rows ni M ay nagiging columns ni M transpose. And ganun naman yung nangyayari sa columns ni M, nagiging rows naman siya ni M transpose. So yung number of rows, siya yung nagiging number of columns and vice versa. All right? Is that good? Sa mga wala pang linear algebra? Or dun sa mga kinilawang na linear algebra, I hope those rang some bells. So no? All right, so that's how you get the transpose. Nababaligtad lang yung row at saka column. So yung size niya, yung dimension niya, nababago rin. So kung siya M by N, nagiging N by M na rin siya. So let's go back here. So if this guy, uh, this is M by N, this guy is uh, M transpose will then be N by M. 
So pag kinuha ko yung M transpose times M, what will the product be? Hopefully, dun sa mga wala pang linear algebra, alam nyo na yung matrix multiplication. But let me know kung hindi rin siya familiar. I, know, I can give you a crash course there also. Uh, sige, nakasagot na si Trisha. So si Ned naman. Sige, Ned, anong size? Nung, nung uh, M transpose times M. N by N matrix po. All right, good. Thank you, Ned. Yeah, yung M transpose M ay N by N na. So medyo masaya tayo kasi square matrix na siya. And it being a square matrix, May allow us, again, emphasis on the may, square matrix na siya, baka naman meron na siya ngayong inverse. Right? If the inverse exists, right? kung nag-exist na si inverse, so basically what I can just do here is I'll pre-multiply both sides by the inverse of M transpose M. M transpose M times its inverse. M transpose M X equals, oops. Ito ko na siya isulat sa next line. Equals M transpose M inverse times M transpose B. All right? Remember, you said this is N by N. Ang inverse and isang N by N matrix ay N by N pa rin. So this guy is N by N. Remember, this is N by 1. So that means this is still well defined. It's going to be an N by 1 matrix. Right? And then what happens? M transpose M inverse, if it exists. Multiply to M, uh, multiply to M transpose M. This will just be the identity matrix. The identity matrix times any vector will just give us the original vector. And then this guy will be also the right hand side. Okay. And this is what we can consider as our solution. X equals M transpose M inverse times M transpose B. Uh, this one. Ito. Yung equation na nakuha after multiplication by M transpose is what we call the normal equation. Kung meron kang square matrix, pwede mong buuin yung normal equation. And that normal equation is a square, uh, is a square system. Ano? Kasi nga yung epekto ng pagmumultiply ng M transpose. Well, you now have a square, uh, a square system, then Hopefully, and actually this happens most of the times, yung M transpose M I invertible. And that's why this solution that we obtained is what we call the normal solution. Kasi siya yung normal, uh, siya yung solution ng, siya yung solution ng normal equation. All right? Now, this is a nice solution because actually it can be proven that this vector X, etong na compute natin na X, eto yung magbibigay na solution na may pinakamaliit na, na L2 norm ng residual. That's why it is called the least square solution. Kasi itong X na to, siya yung makakapag-minimize, siya yung minimizer. So yung mga applied math dyan. So ito yung minimizer ng residual ng MX minus B. Meaning, sa lahat ng vector X na pwede kong i-multiply kay M, Pag kinuha ko yung L2 norm ng MX minus B, yung normal solution, siya yung makapagbibigay sa akin ng pinakamaliit na L2 norm. Wala ng vector X na makapagbibigay ng mas maliit na L2 norm kaysa dun sa normal solution. Right? That's why sometimes the normal solution is also called the least square solution. Least square solution. Kasi nga, siya yung solution na magbibigay ng pinakamalit na, na, na sum ng mga na, sum ng mga squares ng error. Kaya siya least squares solution. Actually, it's, uh, it's really amazing, at least for a nerd like me, ano, na ah, napaka-simple. Normal equation, nag-multiply ka lang both sides ng M transpose and get, you get the solution that is guaranteed to have the least, more, uh, the least residual with respect to the L2. Actually, hindi lang yon yung coincidence. Accidentally, ito rin normal equation, siya rin yung Moore-Penrose solution. Bakit siya Moore-Penrose solution? Because this matrix, ito, yung M transpose M inverse times M transpose, siya yung tinatawag natin na Moore-Penrose pseudo-inverse ni M. And we denote it by M plus. 
So, si M plus siya ay ito. Ayan. Ito yung tinatawag natin na more penrose pseudo inverse ng isang rectangular matrix. So kung hindi siya, walang chance na siya ay maging invertible kasi square siya, kunin mo ito. Kunin mo yung inverse ng M transpose M, tapos multiply mo siya ng M transpose, at ito yung tinatawag natin na simply the pseudo inverse. Or the more penrose pseudo inverse ng matrix M. Siya na yung next best thing to us to an inverse na makukuha natin para kay M in the L2 sense. Okay? So, ngayon, so yung more penrose pseudo inverse, yung gagamitin ko para mag-obtain ng solution. So, yung x star natin, imbes na equal kay M inverse B, kasi nga si M inverse, posibleng hindi mag-exist, gagamitin ko yung pseudo inverse. So, I will define x star to be M pseudo inverse times B. Tapos, ito yung makuha ko, 43 over 110 comma negative 1 over 11. Ito na yung best solution with respect to the L2 norm. Kasi ito yung sinasabi ng normal equation theory. Ito na yung may pinakamaliit na L2 norm. Actually, in fact, if you compute the L2 norm or the relative L2 norm of the solution or the residual, kunin mo yung mx star. Of course, yung mx star, hindi siya exactong equal kay B. Kasi sinabi na natin na hindi posibleng magkaroon ng x na mx is exactly equal to B. Pero pag kinuha natin si x star, which is the one I got from the normal equation, si x star yung least square solution, i-multiply ko siya kay m, i-compare ko yung nakuha ko dun sa right-hand side data vector b, ito yung difference nila. Negative 1 over 110, 3 over 110, negative 1 over 11. I-measure ko yung L2 norm na yan. Dahil nakuha ko siya mula sa normal solution or sa normal equation, ito na yung pinakamaliit na L2 norm. Kahit maglupasay pa tayo, pagkatrahin ng kahit ano pang X star, wala ng X star ang makapagbibigay ng mas maliit na L2 norm para kay M. Ah, para dun sa numerator. Ito na yung pinakamaliit. And then we compute. Sige, yan na pala yung pinakamalapit na pwede nating makuha or pinakamaliit na error vector para dun sa ating inverse problem. Sige, tingnan natin gano'ng kalaki yan with respect to the right-hand side vector. Remember, this is the data that we are matching. So, para makuha yung relative error, kunin mo yung size nung, uh, size nung error, i-divide mo sa size nung ano yung actual solution o nung target data natin. All right? When you do so, we get 1 over the square root of 110, which is actually 0 0.0953. So, meaning, ito na yung pinakamaganda na pwede nating makuha, 9% error. Pero wala na tayong mahihiling pa. Ito na yung pinakamaganda na pwede natin makuha. Right? So, paano kung nagkataon na si M ay invertible? Okay pa rin bang gamitan yung more penrose pseudo inverse? Yun yung kagandahan ng more penrose pseudo inverse. Kasi kung si M ay invertible, yung more penrose pseudo inverse ay magiging equal lamang dun sa actual inverse. So, nag-overlap nag sila. So, you can think of the more penrose pseudo inverse to be a generalization ng inversion. Kasi kung invertible na yung matrix M mo, siya na rin yung more penrose pseudo inverse. Okay? Kung hindi siya invertible, saka lamang mag-apply yung iba't ibang methods pagkuha ng more penrose pseudo inverse. So, paano kung may exact solution? Halimbawa, meron kang mx equals b, si m ay rectangular, pero sir, kunwari, posible na magkaroon ng x. Matitake into account to ba yun dun sa normal solution? Yes. If there is an exact solution to mx equals b, yung exact solution na yun, yun yung ibibigay sa yun ng normal solution. Bakit? Because the normal solution is guaranteed to give us the least square solution. E pag meron kang exact solution, ibig sabihin, may mahanap ka na x ng mx ay equal kay b, that will give us mx minus b equal to the zero vector. Ano ang norm ng zero vector? It will just be zero. And that's the smallest possible norm. So, ibig sabihin, kung meron siyang actual solution, yun din yung ibibigay ng normal solution. Kasi ang promise ng normal solution, ibibigay niya sa akin yung solution na may pinakamaliit na L2 norm ng error. Ang pinakamaliit na posible maging value ng L2 norm ay zero. So, kung posible itong mag-zero, yun yung ibibigay sa akin ng normal solution. Yun yung kagandahan ng pagkuhan ng normal solution. Alright? So, am I making sense? Especially for those who 
haven't gotten linear algebra nor numerical analysis yet. Kaya medyo nagano, change gear ako. Nag-primera ako ngayon. Ano? Para, para medyo lahat tayo ay on the same, uh, on the same pace. Is it okay? Any questions? Umuulan na ba sa mga lugar? Nakas na muna dito sa amin. Papunta po naman ako campus ngayon pagkatapos natin. Ano? Pagkatapos ng klase, yun po na tinatamad na akong umayos ng bahay. But anyway, I hope this is good. All right. So, yeah, meron tayong solution. 9% error, man. Uh, sige, okay na siya. Less than 10% naman. For some applications, that could be good. Pero this is the best that we can get. Kung sa 175, this might be familiar kasi ito yata yung example ko rin sa more Penrose pseudo inverse from uh, from last semester. So, yeah, kung medyo familiar siya. Oh. Okay. okay, so akala ko meron ng illustration dito no error. Okay. Now, ito yung homework na. Ito yung challenge para sa inyo. Akala ko may example, wala pala. So, gusto natin ipakita. Okay, nakita natin dito na yung mx equals b, itong uh, system na to, o itong inverse problem na to. This is ill-posed right away because it didn't satisfy H1. Of course, si H3 hindi na rin, uh, si H2 hindi na rin masasatisfy. So there's no point in checking H3 anymore. Kasi si H1 nag-fail na, so ill post na siya kagad. Now, mapila tayo. So, kinuha natin to. Tapos ito, hindi naman niya masasatisfy si, uh, si H2 kasi medyo vague yung approximately equal. Hindi natin alam how, how good yung approximately equal or yung approximate equality, how good it should be. Pero pag sinabi mo na solve this and find the least square solution, well, yun na. Si H1 at saka si H2 will both be satisfied. So, nare-define ko yung inverse problem to make it solvable. All right? And to, for it to have a unique solution that's satisfying H1 and H2. Now, next question. Okay. Kung sinabi ko na na least square, sino gusto ko maging solution? Ngayon, Satisfy ba si H3? Now, I want you to convince me in homework number two that that's not the case. Kahit na solution na natin, sige, nagawa na natin na H1 and H2 are both met. Hindi pa rin siya well posed. Bakit kasi pakita niyo sa homework or ipapakita niyo sa akin through your homework na siya ay hindi nagde-depend continuously on the data. O yung solution hindi nagde-depend continuously sa data because we can find uh, we can find a perturbation of the data. May makikita kayong uh, maliit na noise na pwedeng idagdag kay 100 that will give us a solution that is far from 43 over 110 and negative 1 over 11. Okay? Paano nyo siya gagawin? Ito yung... Actually, hindi pala. Ah, sorry. Hindi pala yung, yun yung specific matrix. Eh. Ang tagal na kasi nung ginawa ko itong problem. Ano? So, but anyway, ito yung gagawin natin problem sa, sa homework. So, gusto ko ipakita na ito ay hindi na satisfy si H3. Ax equals B. Ito si matrix A. Ito si matrix B. Gusto kong ipakita nyo sa akin na hindi na satisfy si H3. How? Give me an error, a, a noise vector E na pwede kong i-add kay B na ang laki ng relative error. Okay. Ano yung condition ko kay E? Dalawa lang yung hingin ko condition kay E. So, bahala na kayo. Actually, gusto ko nga iba-iba kayo ng noise vector E na ibigay. Kasi makakita ka lang ng isang noise vector kung saan na, napakalaki ng epekto niya dun sa solution, hindi na magiging well posed yung problem. Okay? Ano yung dalawang conditions na hingin ko sa inyo for the noise vector E? Dapat ang laman ni E ay puro positive entries lang, tapos ang size niya ay 1% to B. Right? So here's what I want you to do. You need to find me a noise vector E such that the, ang laman ni E ay lahat positive numbers, right? tapos ang size ni E relative to the right-hand side B ay equal kay 0.01. Ibig sabihin, si E ay 1% noise. 
Kasi ang relative size niya with respect to the data ay 1%. Tapos, gusto kong mangyari, you find me a vector E such that yung, yung solution yung solution ng mx equals b plus e or approximately equal is far from the solution of mx approximately equal to e. right? So magalap ka ng vector e ng size ay 1% ni vector b such that kunin mo yung solution nito Dapat malayo siya sa solution mo. Right? So, paano niyo gagawin yan? Mag-isip ka muna ng E. I want you to find a clever way of think of a clever way. Paano makakahanap ng matrix na ang size ay 0 0.01? Simple algebra para ma-force nyo. Kasi kay MATLAB ay nimbawa. Yung sa mga nagba-MATLAB or nag-start pa lang gumamit kay MATLAB. Ano? So, pwede nyo gawin ay para mag-generate ng random numbers. Pwede nyo gamitin yung RAND command. Halimbawa, si E, gagawin nyo, uh, i-assign nyo kay MATLAB. So, ito exacto yung itatag nyo kay MATLAB. E equals RAND na kung ano yung size ng random vector na gusto nyo i-generate. Okay? So, RAND ng, say, ano nga yung size? Si E ay nanggagaling sa R3. So, gusto ko na 3 by 1. So, kapag ka in-input nyo kay MATLAB, yung RAND 3, 1, bibigyan ka niya ng 3 by 1 vector or 3 by 1 matrix na ang laman ay mga random numbers from 0 to 1. Okay? So, isang problema sa kanya, yung size niya ay hindi equal kay 1% with B. So, think of a clever way. Mga mathematicians kayo, ano? So, kaya nyo i-work out yung algebra para mas scale nyo to. So gusto nyo ngayon, ang size nito ay maging 1% nung size nung right-hand side vector B. So para hindi kayo nag-iisip na yung random vector, ano, pagawa nyo ito kay Mata. Tapos multiplyan nyo lang to ng isang constant, say alpha, na, na, na mag-garantee na yung size ni, ni E after the multiplication by the scaling constant alpha ay magiging 1% ni B. O yun yung clue. Pagawa nyo ito kay MATLAB, pero i-determine nyo ano dapat si alpha. Ano yung i-add nyo, doon, uh, ano yung i-multiply nyo doon sa random vector para yung size ng product ay 1%. Nyo. So gusto kong pag-isipan nyo yan. Part ito ng process. Pag-isip ng mga, ng mga, ng mga paraan para makuha yung gusto mong klase ng noise, gusto mo ng data, or programming, or solving any problem in general. Okay? Tapos, hindi meron ka ng E, tapos ang gawin mo, solve mo yung MX equals B plus E, ay makukuha ko ditong solution, tawagin natin X prime. Tapos, isolve mo rin yung MX equals B, ay makukuha tayo yung X star. And then, para mapakita, na si uh, H3 ay hindi na-satisfied, kailangan ipakita niyo sa akin na yung X star minus X prime, L2 norm niya, divided by the L2 norm of the actual solution, dapat ay malayo sa so 0 point, ah, dapat mas malaki. It should be much greater than 0 0.01. At least 10 times, be 0 0.01. Ibig sabihin, yung 1% na noise na inintroduce nyo, dapat napakalaki ng epekto niya doon sa solution. Alright? Uh, does the solution make sense? Uh, does the homework make sense now? Any questions? Sabi, super lakas na nung ulan. Hindi ko na marinig yung sarili ko. So, pero hopefully, okay yung, uh, okay yung audio ko. Kasi nakatira ako sa ano. Uh, yung kwarto ko, ang pintana niya, uh, ilog yung nakikita ko sa pintana. So, pinigarinig ko yung mga, yung ula na tumatama sa mga, sa mga puno. Ano. So, any questions about the homework? Do you 
you think you can finish it by Friday? Or hindi nyo pa kasi nasimulan? But I, uh, but I uh, suggest you uh, you try to use MATLAB for this, lalo na dun sa pag-generate ng random vector, ano? Kasi medyo mahirap siyang gawin. Sige, try, try it, uh, try it uh, today or tomorrow. And then when we meet on Thursday, Give me your feedback. Sabihan nyo lang akong kailangan nyo ng more time to finish the homework. We can postpone it to uh, to next week. Pero sabihin nyo sa akin sa, sa Thursday, you know. And then you can ask questions, clarificatory questions on Thursday uh, about the homework. Tapos sabihin nyo kung hindi kayang tapusin yung Friday, pwede natin i-move ng, ng next week, you know. But please try it para sa Thursday, alam nyo, sa, alam nyo yung itatanong nyo sa akin. Right? That uh, is that fair? Is that a good deal? All right. Hopefully it is. And that ends module number two. We have more than some hours. Ang haba kasi nung review ko talaga. Pero uh, I hope that's fine. So yeah, before we move to module three, kasi marami pang time, you know, uh, siguro i-introduce ko yung module number three. Uh, let's have a two-minute break muna. Kumusta yung mga nasa campus? Okay pa ba mga internet mo? Okay, good. Uh, thank you, Neo. Next time ko rin mapuputol ako ng kaunti eh. <laughs> Kasi pagka umuulan, medyo yung internet ko dito sa bahay ay in okay, so we just have uh, two minutes, uh, two minutes. Fabulous. 10 minutes left, sorry. 10 minutes left. So, introduce ko siguro yung gagawin natin sa module number 3. Uh, that means, yan, makaka-time pa ako na improve it. Kakaya yung mga typo errors dito. Pero, yan, papangatawa ko na lang. Ipocorrect na lang natin siya as we go along. So, module number 3 will introduce us to a certain inverse problem. And show that this inverse problem is imposed. Kasi kanina yung, uh, yung kinonsider natin, medyo... Parang textbook problem siya, no? Wala pa siyang masyadong implication. Now, we'll look at the specific uh, inverse problem. Ito yung deconvolution process. Titingnan natin at illustrate natin yung pagiging ill post niya. I tried to follow the discussion ni Siltanen dun sa book na pinigay ko sa inyo. Uh, start na to nung chapter 2 niya, I guess, section 2.1. I, I tried to recreate the solutions, pero mas maganda yung solution niya na obtain kesa dun sa solution na nakuha ko in the sense of uh, illustrating um, the ill posedness of the, the convolution process. But anyway, we can do this and probably siguro next time I can share with you the MATLAB code that I use to play with uh, this um, this inverse problem. Kasi medyo maganda to, napaka profound no example. Kasi ang gagawin natin, we will dive into specific inverse problems in the hopes na along the way, yung mga techniques na ginamit nila Doon sa pag-solve ng specific uh, inverse problem, may mapipick up natin. And uh, to a point that we will be able to adapt these schemes pag-solve ng mga inverse problems na to solve natin later for, say, your SP, your uh, thesis, or basically your project for the course. So, ganun yung naging approach. Papakita ko paano sila nag-work in a certain inverse problem, paano nila sinolusyonan, halimbawa, yung uh, pagkakaroon ng isang continuum model o isang continuous model 
paano nila na-transform yun sa isang discrete or finite model na pwede nilang ipasolve sa isang computer. Right? So, yun yung takeaways natin dito. So, medyo technical. Yung laman ng module 3, siguro you will be feeling like you're reading a um, uh, a journal article wala dito sa module number 3. Kasi medyo technical na nga yung content niya. Pero ganun yung gagawin natin. Medyo applied math yung approach natin. Uh, magiging motivated by a certain problem yung ating pag-create ng math. Ano? So kasi kung, kung medyo pure math yung perspective mo, your your approach would be uh, start with a bunch of actions ano? and then develop the theorems for the action and then derive some more theorems and so on. So you get the mathematical system. So you start with foundational concepts, undefined terms, plus the actions. And then from there, you will develop theorems. Yun yung nagiging approach. Sa medyo applied na approach, meron ka munang isang problem. So you think of a specific phenomenon. For instance, dito sa ating module number three, ang phenomen phenomenon na deconvolution or convolution. Kasi yung convolution siya yung forward problem, yung deconvolution siya yung inverse problem. So say in the process of convolution, titingnan natin ano yung math na kailangan kong i-develop para ma-solve yung deconvolution o convolution process. So para meron muna tayong end goal, gusto kong ma-create ng solution para sa convolution problem. Doon naka-focus yung pag-develop ko ng math. So nakatingin siya dun sa gusto mong outcome. Whereas kung pure math ka o yung ganun yung perspective mo, Wala kang pakialam dun sa posibleng application o posibleng maging implication ng theory, theory na i-develop mo. Gusto mo lamang pag-aralan yung theory for its elegance. Ano? Uh, medyo yung traditional outlook about math. Kasi nung sinaunang panahon, yan, biglang napapamaten ako. So medyo, yeah. Pero nung mga, nung mga unang panahon kasi, past time lang yung math. Oh, hello? Parang nagkaroon ng mabilisang brownout dito. Split second na matay yung ilaw ko. Pero hopefully I'm still here. Um, nung sinaunang panahon kasi, yung being a mathematician is not an actual career. It's just a hobby on the side. That's why pag nag-search ka ng famous mathematicians, lahat sila ay merong, merong actual job. Parang side job lang nila yung pagiging mathematician. For instance, sino nga ba? Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton is a physicist. Right? Before he is a mathematician. Pero siya yung naka-invento ng calculus. Blaise Pascal. So si Blaise Pascal ay... Um, ano nga ba si Blaise Pascal? Abogado nga ba siya or purely computer scientist siya? Pero he's a mathematician on the side. So parang side job lang nila yung mathematics. Nagiging hobby lang nila yon. Pero they are philosophers, they are lawyers, they are physicists, and other applied scientists. So parang talagang they're studying math for the beauty of it. So ganun yung nangyayong pagtingin sa, sa, sa pure math. And usually ganun din sa mga pag-develop ng pure math uh, courses. Pero dito sa special topics, babalik na rin natin. Medyo applied math yung, yung, uh, yung approach. Ibibenta ko muna sa inyo yung problem. Tapos depende dun sa problem, dun natin i-develop yung mga tools. Right? And what we'll be looking at at this particular module is the process of convolution is. And in relation to that, bakit natin i-develop or i-discuss yung deconvolution? Kasi gusto kong ma-illustrate kung ano yung tinatawag natin na inverse prime. So at the end of module number three, you should be able to, number one, describe ano nga ba yung inverse, inverse prime and bakit napaka-prone ng mga inverse problems to inverse prime or we as solvers of inverse uh, problems, why are we so prone to commit the inverse prime? Right? Tapos along the way, matututunan din natin na mag-discretize ng isang linear inverse problem. So kasi yung inverse problem na makikita natin ay continuous. Meaning, yung operator natin ay from a set of functions of infinite dimension to another function of infinite dimensions. Pero hindi tayo marunong mag-solve or magpa-solve sa computer ng paghahanap ng isang function. All right? Kasi ang mga computers, kaya nila mag-work ng matrices, kahit malalaki ng matrices, at saka vectors. Pero pag functions, hindi sila design to, uh, to think like a human in terms of solving a problem that requires a function as a solution. Ano? So titingnan natin, paano natin matatransform ang isang continuous problem into 
a linear problem that is solvable using a computer. Okay, and then also I would I I would also like you to uh, to be able to perform some naive reconstructions and illustrate inverse prime. Kaya medyo sisimula ko siguro yung pagpapakita ng MATLAB codes as we go along module number three. Pero the bulk of module number three is first to understand the discretization process. And after we discuss the discretization process, I'll present to you one solution and we will see there nasaan yung inverse prime. O ano yung inverse prime doon. And uh, the problem that we'll be looking for is the convolution forward problem, which has the, the convolution process as its inverse problem. Ano nga ba yung convolution? So I will cons uh, we will define the convolution operator this way. Ang kanyang, uh, ang kanyang domain, ang domain ng convolution operator, say, let's call it purely A, I set of all continuous functions on an interval I1. So kukuha ka ng isang function na continuous uh, close interval I1, tapos when we apply the convolution operator to it, ang makukuha natin ay isa uling continuous function pero posibleng iba na yung kanyang interval. So ang output ay isang continuous function over the interval I3, for instance. Okay? Now, paano nangyayari yung transformation? Pag kumuha ka ng isang function dun sa input space, ang output niya ay psi star f, which is basically the convolution of the function psi with the function with the input function f. All right? Ano si psi? Si psi ay isang fixed na function. Si psi ay isang function na continuous sa isang interval i2. So medyo posibleng iba-iba yung uh, yung interval kung saan continuous yung mga yung mga given functions. Input function continuous sa i1. Yung fixed na pang-convolution natin ay continuous sa i2. Tapos yung output ay continuous sa i2. Tapos, paano ko i-convolve si psi at saka si f? Or how do I get the image of a continuous function under the convolution operator? Yun ito siya gagawin. Okay? Pag meron kang input function a, okay? ah, sorry, pag meron kang input function f, tapos i-convolve ko siya kay psi. Ibig sabihin, etong psi star f siya yung equal sa af, ano? Tapos itong AF, remember our notation na to ay actually uh, AF. Kukunin ko muna si AF. Tapos i-apply ko sa kanya si X. Alright? Yun yung ibig sabihin nito, right? So kasi si F muna ipapaso ko muna siya dun sa convolution operator bago ako mag-plug in ng X dun sa final X. So how do we compute the function uh, AF? Ganto daw yung function AF. Yung function AF ay equal dito. Kukunin mo yung integral ng psi y times f of x y with respect to y over the interval i2. Okay? Sir, bakit dalawa yung variable dyan? Uh, si x kailangan matira siya na variable kasi si x siya ay element ng domain ni a f. Right? So si x ay nasa domain ni a f. Kasi siya yung ini-input natin kay AF. So dapat meron ka pa rin variable X dun sa final answer. Kasi yung hinahanap natin, ano yung itsura ng AF of X? Yung image ni X under the convolution of F. Or the image of F under the convolution. Okay? So, paano siya kinocompute? Integral lamang siya ng psi times F of X minus Y with respect to Y. So, kung computein mo itong integral na to, pero the integration happens with respect to y. Okay? Sino si y? Siya isang number na nanggagaling sa domain ni psi. Kaya si psi ay isang function that is continuous on i2. Kasi yung mga y's, kung saan tayo nag-integrate nag over, ay galing sa interval i2. So, kung compute natin yung integral ng product over the uh, interval i2, Pero nag integrate tayo with respect to y. So lahat ng excess na nakikita nyo ay treat natin as a constant. Kasi dito nag integrate lang tayo with respect to y. X is treated as a constant. So what we get here, okay, 
or under this definite integral ay isang function ni x. Mawawala yung mga y's kasi pag nag-integrate ka, evaluate mo yung definite integral on the y values over the interval line. Kung mawawala yung mga y's, kasi definite integral to with respect to y, matitira lang yung variable x. Kung ano man yung function dito ni x, yun yung image ni f under the convolution function. Okay? So I'll start next uh, next meeting by giving you a specific example ng pagkocompute ng convolution. Para makita niyo yung proseso, ano yung ibig sabihin na to, na parang kakaiba kasi dalawang variables yung involved. Pero, yeah, I'll start there. Kasi medyo high-tech na yung high-tech. Medyo, ano na, medyo, ito yung example na ibibigay ko sana. Ito yung paglalaroan natin. Ito si function f. Yung convolution niya ay ito. Pag in-apply in niyo yung convolution operator kay, kay f. Right? O yung specific convolution operator na define ko. And, this is nice because convolution or the convolution actually I related siya sa image de blurring. Pwede mong i-imagine ito as ito yung pinikturan mo pero dahil hindi naka-focus yung camera na ginamit mo or medyo gumalaw ka habang pinipikturan mo itong image na to, ito yung nakuha mong image. Now the inverse problem is what if ito yung picture gusto kong i-sharpen siya. Gusto kong makuha yung sharp image na ito. So how do we get from here back to the original data? Yun yung deconvolution. At yun yung titingnan natin uh, next meeting or starting next meeting. And we will show na ito ay ill-pose. Kaya kailangan medyo maging extra careful tayo in performing the deconvolution process. Hindi gagana yung basic reconstruction na gagamitin natin by using just the inverse operator A. Actually, mahirap nang compute yung yung um, inverse operator A, pero hindi pa siya enough. Kailangan pa natin mag-develop ng math paano matatanggal yung epekto ng noise doon sa solution. Right? But let's do that next meeting. Uh, sorry, overtime na naman ako by five minutes. So, uh, any questions? Okay din pala na medyo mahaba yung intro. Saka maraming side comments, you know, para kakaunti lang yung makukover natin every meeting. Kasi medyo mabigat yung mga topics it will take time for you to to digest everything you know kaysa bilisan ko at matapos natin yung modules ng uh, ng maaga pero medyo mahirap naman yung uh, mahirap yung uh, oh, hindi natin makuha yung maximum understand okay so if there are no questions then again uh yung mga nag-recite verbally today please drop a comment on the chat box so i know that you recited uh and then um yeah try to answer the homework homework number 2 in module number 2 it's originally due on Friday, all right? Pero let me know on Thursday if you have questions or if you think uh, you need some more time to finish it. I'll be more than happy to extend the deadline for you, but let me know. Say nyo dapat manggaling yun. Uh, if you also have questions, I can throw out some hints on Thursday. Pero again, let me know and I'll start the conversation about the homework on Thursday. And aside from that, I think we're good to go, all right? So thank you guys for joining me today. Keep dry and safe. Malakas yung ulan. But uh, yeah, I hope you, you keep safe. Sana hindi na siya lumakas kasi I'll be in campus this afternoon. Sana si Padi na kung lumabas ng bahay. But anyway, thank you guys and I'll see you on Thursday. Bye everyone. Thank you po sir. Thank you sir.